Attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Government preparations, mounting criticism, and the long hot summer. Plus this day in history with the Rosenbergs' execution and our song of the day by Arcade Fire on your morning monarchy for June 19th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are in the world for listener-supported media brought to you by you. A couple seconds after 9 a.m. streaming, as always, from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in Portland, Oregon, as I like to call it, Peak Portland. Hope you're doing well, safe, sound, whenever, wherever you are. Glad you are here, my friends. Starting another week of Media Monarchy. Super stoked. Glad you're here. And glad you're here in the chat. And glad you're on the stream at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. You can find the links to the new chat in Discord up on the tweets. And that's the same place you can find all the stories we are about to talk about for this next hour. And we are brought to you by you. Huge thanks to our latest patron over on Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy. That's Jesse E. And a huge thanks to John A. If that is your real name. Over on PayPal.me slash MediaMonarchy. That keeps us going and growing and moving and grooving, my friends. We've also got snail mail, post office box, and we've got Bitcoin. As I like to say, if you can give a little, I can give a lot. And again, all those links are at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. Huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying your morning monarchy broadcast. Podcast, rather. It's afterwards. However, in the moment, like right now, RadioConfluence.com. Huge thanks to them. They simulcast and rebroadcast almost nearly all your Media Monarchy broadcast. So huge thanks to the growing indie community at RadioConfluence.com. Hallelujah, you guys. Good news. Everything now back online. All the missing episodes that were gone over the last week and a half, nearly two weeks, finally got fixed. We got our server woes figured out. We got the space. We got everything uploaded. Everything is back in its right place, as it should be. And a huge thanks to DJ Sumdog and Afix for doing a little bit of the work, getting under the hood, helping me out. I kind of know what I'm doing, but at a certain level, it's like, I don't know what that stuff means. I don't want to push those buttons. So we are back, and all the episodes are back. So as the emails did start to trickle in slowly, surely, it took about a week and a half for the emails to really start coming in and going, dude, your podcast didn't work. I haven't listened to a show. I'm having withdrawal. What's the deal? It's all fixed. Everything's fixed. All the episodes should all be there. If they're not fully loading up, you know, you don't have to, as the IT crowd says, you know, try turning it off and on. Delete it. Add it back in, and it all should be there, and it all should be good. So again, a huge thanks to Afix, and a huge thanks to DJ Sumdog, who I got to meet last week. Our new friend Summit is passing through the Portland area, so we got some pies and pints and did a little tech support last week. It was quite the meet and greet week for me. We also met new friend Peter, who lives here in Portland. We got to spend a little bit of time together, and even met yesterday, that's three new people in the last week, in meet space, meeting people in the real world. Woot, woot, exactly. Huge thanks to Dimitri. He's passing through the Portland area on bike. Pretty sure he rode on bike from Chicago to California. Then he borrowed a car and he's on a little bit of a West Coast tour. And he came up and a huge thanks. He got to meet and greet with me. And actually Cassie joined us as well for a few more pies and pints. So it's fantastic. And I think it's a really important thing to do as these things get more important, as times get more dire, it seems. I think meeting people in the real world is really going to help. And it makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. So again, my friends, a couple minutes after 9 a.m., you're joining us on The Morning Monarchy. Each day of the week, we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday is world news, and there is no shortage of it. Good God. There's a lot to go on, and I got a lot of follow-ups for stories that we've covered in the past as well. So as we glance at the breaking lame stream news, it's extremely lame. UK police investigating van attack in London as terrorism. That's the Finsbury Park attack. You now almost need a scorecard to keep track of all of the events. Pretty much on a daily, if not every other hourly basis. So that's the Finsbury Park attack where I believe there are no deaths and everybody got busted. Finsbury Mosque attack. EDL founder Tommy Robinson called Hate Preacher. So while that is going on, you're looking at one van attack. We look at the news right here on This Morning, and there's breaking news again out of Paris. France correspondent Melissa Bell joins us right now for some details on what we're seeing in the Champs-Élysées. A police mobile unit rammed by a vehicle. Melissa, what can you tell us? 
Uh, well, it's been within the last hour, John. This really has just happened here on the Champs Elysees. Perhaps you can see just behind my shoulder down there, the bottom half of the Champs Elysees, leading towards the Concorde, is the part that's been cordoned off, uh, John. What we can see down there is one car that's been stopped in the middle uh, of that police cordon, a white car that's been covered in the sort of material you spray on cars to put them out. Uh, and across the road, a man on the ground, and he's been there for the last hour. I could clearly see him when I was down there earlier on. Now, what the police police have confirmed uh, to us is that that car did try to ram into a police uh, truck. No news yet though, John, on whether this was a deliberate intentional attack on the part of the man driving the car uh, or not. Clearly a massive police uh, presence, however, down there. The cordon has been growing really by the minute with onlookers being pushed further and further back. And just to provide a bit of context, it was right here, of course, just a few weeks ago back in April, security forces were once again targeted. A police police uh, truck was targeted by a man who sadly uh, took the life of one policeman. No word yet on whether this is that sort of incident or not, John. So, police truck. There's Dead Kennedy's memes for you. Car rams police van on Champs-Élysées. Armed suspect may be dead, police say. The car ramming memes are running amok. And I'm even seeing in the chat there's a stabbing in the London tube station. I don't have that in front of me. But we'll continue to track that. We will talk about the Syrian warplane in just a few minutes. And a big SCOTUS case. Of course, as they're starting to wrap it all up, they're going to start to dole out all kinds of decisions. Supreme Court rules government can't refuse disparaging trademarks. The Supreme Court on Monday struck down part of a law that bans offensive trademarks in a ruling, of course, that is expected to help the football team with the offensive name. However, this case was brought by my buddy Simon Tam of Portland band The Slants. They tried to patent their name, The Slants. They are all Asian American. And the patent office told them, no, that's offensive. I was like, oh, well, thanks for being offended on my behalf, but that's my name and I want to call it that. We interviewed Simon Tam. Their slants are based right here in Portland. We talked to him, I believe, on December 31st, 2015, just days before we were launching the Morning Monarchy show. So you can find our interview with Simon Tam as this case was still crawling through the courts. Meanwhile, over in Virginia, 17-year-old Muslim girl assaulted and killed after leaving Virginia Mosque. And even back here in Portland, I see high-ranking Portland public school managers get $16,000 raises. That's a pretty good gig if you can get it right. I also see on the sidebar a story we'll have to talk about a little later this week. Legendary Portland jazz musician Thera Memory has died at the age of 68. Thera Memory most recently being in the news for molestation allegations. So all of those allegations disappear into a puff of smoke, as it were. We are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. I'd love for you to share the link with a friend. We are independent, non-commercial alternative media, hopefully done in a fear-free fashion, my friends. And all the stories we're about to talk about are at the top of the tweets at Media Monarchy. So I think as we sort of dive into this new daunting week, let's do it, I suppose, in a, in a daunting way. The question is subtly Malthusian in nature. How to deal with the world's teeming billions in one fell swoop while maintaining the existing social and political orders in all of the countries? That's the question the powers that shouldn't be are asking. That order needs only to have one facade now, as draconian an order that can be accomplished without throwing the world into revolution against every government in existence. That draconian nature is as follows. CCTV cameras monitoring and cross-referencing every purchase, every bank withdrawal, every deposit, every movement, every social engagement. The draconian nature is one of continuous monitoring, with a rise in prices and a steadily declining world economy as natural resources are quietly siphoned off by the politicos and the oligarchs to stockpile for their use when the plug is pulled. As much draconian repression and s control under a soft police state with continuous monitoring while those in power lay the groundwork to th collapse the whole system and kill off most of the world's population while they try to remain safe and in power. The question of the existing social and political order being maintained is being addressed in all of the countries of the world. In the 90s, the oligarchs rose to power after the Soviet Union's collapse. Since Putin came to power, the oligarchs who delved into politics against the wishes of the Politburo were crushed. Those who knuckled under were given a slice of the pie with impunity and the sign-off of the politicos and are big today, even with partial or complete nationalization of their private industries. In the United States, 
We've seen a great deal of stockpiling by government agencies and the administration under the previous puppet administration. Secret warehouses and undisclosed locations have been filled with medical supplies stockpiled across the country in the event of a catastrophe. Cheyenne Mountain as a fallback command and control center has been reopened once again. Extensive networks of tunnels and bunkers have been constructed in, around, and leading to Denver, Colorado, with secret deliveries night and day for more than eight years. Billions of rounds of ammunition have been ordered and purchased by the Department of Homeland Security and all the other alphabet agencies, including the U.S. Postal Service, which has a huge role to play in continuity of government and post-war reconstruction. Your postmaster general suddenly becomes quite the chief of the police state if you actually look at the executive orders. Emergency drills to include catastrophic plague and nuclear war terrorism have been gamed extensively over the past several years. All these things, the stockpiling of the food, the supplies, the prep for some massive event, point to one thing, an event's eventually going to happen. We have all the flashpoints all around the world, North Korea, Syria, Ukraine, Second Cold War forming between the U.S. and Russia. Those flashpoints are artificially created. We have some that are artificially created that can be blamed on nature, such as Ebola and the looming Fukushima disaster. War is the easiest way to bring it all about, plain and simple. Putin recently announced that nuclear war between, the Russia, between Russia and the United States would leave the world destroyed with no winners. <gasps> Not so. The governments and their elites of politics and business will probably win in the end. The governments of the world have to keep their citizenry under control until they execute the plan that eliminates the majority of the population. War is truly the only way to do it in one fell swoop that leaves no one accountable at the end. We're going to see a resist and the most likely thing to accomplish this war. A reset, rather. <laughs> I saw the word resist because that's what you're seeing everywhere. Hashtag resist. CNN's involved. Your sister-in-law's involved. We're going to see a reset. And the most likely thing to accomplish this would be war. Historically, it's the vehicle for which governments, beleaguered by their citizens, have been able to bypass controls in the open to subvert democratic processes and inculcate martial law and eventually totalitarian control. We're halfway through the year. God. And the situation in the world and domestically has not improved. It's worsened. As ever, 2017 continues to tell the awful 2016, hold my beer. Many people have documented film FEMA camps, preps for martial law, deep underground military bases, tunnels, systematic grafting of procedures to be followed after an apocalyptic war event. Such procedures include the garnering of all human natural resources under executive order. Trump hasn't repealed that one yet, has he? The pervasive surveillance system, the negation of posse comitatus, and the control of the United States domestically in the event of war or collapse of the government. All that is lacking is the crisis. No government, as we're seeing all around the world, ever allows a crisis to go to waste. And all the crises are contrived or crafted beforehand to allow them to occur. War has always accomplished the resets of all countries and empires in ages past. And this era will be no different, no matter who's at the helm of the ship, especially when the course is purposefully charted right for the rocks. So that's the happy way we begin this week. Massive government preparations and stockpiling point to one thing. An event's going to happen. That posted by Tyler Durden to Zero Hedge. And so as we begin to look at that, let's look at all of these situations. Let's look at all these various crises playing out. However, let's do it with the caveat of wondering and knowing and believing what's real and what's not. Non-factual false news reporting has, of course, political consequences. The Associated Press is a non-profit and politically neutral news agency financed by U.S. newspapers and other media outlets of very various political stripes. Its wide range of customers mostly prevents it from partisan domestic reporting. It takes on international issues are different. The selection of the news items it reports on is driven by customer interests and thereby slanted in its selection. But the factual reporting on news items is generally straightforward, or supposed to be such. Political decisions are sometimes based on its reports. It is therefore causing concern when it spreads, obviously, say it with me, hashtag fake news. A couple days ago, the AP pushed this out. Russia claims it has killed IS leader al-Baghdadi. New York Daily News, Fox Politico, many, many, many others 
republish that piece. Politico version reads, Russia claimed Friday it killed the leader of the Islamic State group in an airstrike targeting a meeting of IS leaders just outside the group's de facto capital in Syria. The Russia Defense Ministry said Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed in a Russian airstrike in late May along with other senior group commanders. The AP item seemed wrong. Russia's usually very cautious with such claims and tends not to make such absolute statements. The U.S. military, though, is a different thing. So you check with TASS, the official Rus- Russian news agency, T-A-S-S, and it indeed reported something different. IS top leader may have been killed by Russian airstrike in Syria. Other Russian news sources reported that likewise the Russian defense ministry never claimed that its forces killed Baghdadi. It only said it's looking into such claims. The New York Times, with its own reporter in Moscow, also reported more carefully. Might have killed. Looking into. Possibly killing. Obviously, the Associated Press report distributed widely, which I even mentioned to you as breaking news on Friday. Oh, this just in. They're saying this. And I believe I hopefully joked, how many times have they killed this guy? Or how many times will they kill this guy? Is AP exaggerating? They blame Russia when the claim turns out to be false? Let's see. Here's Bob with the sports. Russia's defense ministry has released images showing the aftermath of airstrikes believed to have killed the leader of Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The pictures show how an ISIL command center near the Syrian city of Raqqa looked before the Russian airstrikes and afterwards. The assault is believed to have killed up to 30 ISIL commanders and hundreds of fighters at the terror group's so-called military council. Officials are still verifying reports of al-Baghdadi's death. As yet, there's been no official confirmation. Of course I heard reports on the elimination of al-Baghdadi, but I still have no 100% confirmation of this. The US also says it's not been able to confirm the death of the head of the terror group either. Ilya Petranka joined Kevin in the studio earlier with more details. At the end of May, uh, the Russian army uh, got hold of intelligence pointing to a big get-together of Islamic State commanders to discuss plans, how they can retreat, how uh, can they flee the city. We got to look at Raqqa here. This is the de facto Islamic State capital that's been under the siege by the coalition forces for a while now. And the only way to retreat from that city for the jihadists is to the south. Now, and after using drones to examine the location, the Russian Air Force carried out a major airstrike in which they say 30 ISIL commanders were destroyed and also as many as 300 fighters killed. Now, if it is proved three weeks almost uh, since that al-Baghdadi was also there. Of course, that is going to be big news. We still got to be really careful about this because we do have to remember that al-Baghdadi is ISIL's most important man. And since 2011, he's had a huge bounty on his head. In particular, the Americans were offering $25 million for any information on the whereabouts, any kind of data that could lead to his capture or death. We asked award-winning world affairs journalist Martin Jay how al-Baghdadi's killing, if it's confirmed, would impact the fight against the extremist group. ISIL has changed quite dramatically in the last couple of years. Yes, you have, if you've killed um, him, you have removed the head of the caliphate, the so-called Islamic State, which should have an impact. But um, the Islamic State, as we know it, which stretched across Syria and into parts of Iraq, no longer exists anymore as Mosul is the last outpost there in Iraq to be taken. So I think um, I think the, li- the, the impact will actually be limited in, in towards um, how the group goes about its bases. It's spread very thinly and it's expanding. So there's our, our Russian handlers at RT giving us our, our marching orders. <laughs> Again, everything we say in play will always be included in the show notes, all the articles, all the links, all the videos. For the record, Russia and Syria and other allies have fought ISIS whenever, wherever they possibly could. It was the U.S. that didn't. They don't fight ISIS, and they use it for their own purpose. Obama and Kerry have publicly admitted as such. Only after Russia pointed out that thousands of tanker trucks moved oil from ISIS areas to Turkey without U.S. interference did the U.S. join in to destroy them which sets the stage for the next 
crisis that we could be looking at. The U.S.-led coalition has downed a government warplane in southern Syria. The Syrian army and coalition have announced in separate statements the Syrian military added that the plane's pilot was now missing. The United States military has shot down a warplane in Syria. It is the first time this has happened since the U.S. took an active role in the Syrian conflict. Now, the plane was shot down. It was a Syrian regime bomber, we're learning, that is said to have attacked coalition-supported fighters on the ground. This is where it happened, near the city of Raqqa, the ISIS stronghold in northern Syria. Now, a statement from the coalition, which is led by the United States, that its forces were responding to the Syrian bombing, which did cause casualties on the ground, and that the Syrian jet was shot down in self-defense. Again, the U.S. military, for the first time, has shot down a Syrian Air Force warplane. This breaking news about the U.S. shooting down a Syrian Air Force jet, this is the first time this has happened, although coalition partners have engaged in direct combat in the skies over Syria. But how big of a development is this in the coalition's war against ISIS? It, I, I think we need to be careful uh, in talking to this in terms of escalatory uh, measures. Uh, two, a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, uh, this was done uh, in, in defense of Syrian Democratic forces that the coalition was supporting and has been supporting on the ground. That is a commitment that the coalition made uh, a long time ago when we agreed to help the Syrian Democratic forces on the ground. We made it very clear publicly, not just to them, but publicly, that if they came under fire, if they came under attack, we would come to their defense. So this was a long-standing un understanding between the coalition and certainly the regime. Uh, number two, I think you can look at this as a, a potentially a deterrent attack. In other words, they had to do this, but maybe it'll have a deterrent effect on the regime. Hmm. I don't see this as escalatory. This was something that we committed to doing a long time ago, and we've and sadly had to, had to come through on it here. How far up the chain of command would that decision have gone? I, I don't know, uh, since I'm not uh, inside the chain of command anymore, I doubt it had to go very, very high. Again, uh, the commander on the ground has the authority to defend uh, his forces, and we have the authority to defend the forces that we're supporting on the ground. So I don't think this, this left theater. If you're asking if this sort of had to go to the Pentagon or yeah. had to come to Washington, I highly doubt that. I would suspect that the commander there uh, in charge of the co coalition ops had the authority to do this on his own. Retired Rear Admiral John Kirby, thanks as always. There you go from the Clinton News Network. But according to the Syrian statement, the plane was carrying out operations against the Islamic State, IS, the artist formerly known as ISIS and ISIL. They were around the countryside around Raqqa when it was targeted, leading to a crash and the loss of the pilot. This attack comes at a time when the Syrian Arab Army and its allies are advancing in the fight against ISIS terrorists who are being defeated in the Syrian desert in more ways than one. The statement added that although such attacks seek to undermine the Syrian armed forces' struggle against terrorism, they will not be deterred in fighting for stability and security in the Syrian Air Republic. The downing of the Syrian warplane, an Su-22, was confirmed by an official statement from Operation Inherent Resolve, the U.S.-led international task force against IS, which accused the Syrian government of targeting fighters from the Syrian Democratic Forces, a Kurdish-led militia. So we have to continue to watch that situation. So all the things that come out as being hidden or buried or headlines. The admissions get really interesting. A New Zealand general has confirmed that the U.S.-led coalition fighting in Mosul has used munitions loaded with white phosphorus. It comes amid mounting criticism over the use of the multi-purpose weapon, which can be extremely dangerous to civilians. Over the past few weeks, an increasing number of claims have pointed to the use of white phosphorus munitions by the U.S.-led coalition in Mosul, Iraq, and Raqqa, Syria, the aforementioned, the two strongholds of ISIS. The use of the weapons in Mosul was confirmed by New Zealand's Brigadier General Hugh McAslin. We have utilized white phosphorus to screen areas within West Mosul to get civilians out safely by killing them. This appears to be the first confirmation of its kind. Previously, the coalition reported using white phosphorus munitions in rural areas of Iraq, but not in densely populated cities. You know, just, just out in the country, where those even less able to defend themselves would have lived. The confirmation comes as the increasingly questionable Human Rights Watch criticized the coalition on Wednesday for deploying the controversial type of munitions in the fight against ISIS. No matter how white phosphorus is used, it poses a high-risk, horrific, long-lasting harm in crowded cities like Raqqa and Mosul. Massive populations of civilians. U.S.-led coalition acknowledges the use 
of white phosphorus in Mosul amid mounting criticism. But that's not all. An international team is preparing a lawsuit against NATO over the alliance's use of depleted uranium munitions during its bombing of Yugoslavia. Up to 15 tons of depleted uranium used in 1999 Serbia bombing, so says lead lawyer in a new lawsuit against NATO. The NATO bombing of Serbia in 1999 used between 10 and 15 tons of depleted uranium, which causes major environmental disasters, said Sir John Aleksic, Serbian lawyer who leads the legal team, which includes lawyers from the EU, Russia, China, and India. The legal team was formed by the Serbian Royal Academy of Scientists and Artists. In Serbia, 33,000 people fall sick because of this every year. That's one child a day. Serbia is launching a lawsuit against NATO over the bombing in 1999. According to their legal team, it used depleted uranium munitions, and these have allegedly caused the rise in cancer-related illnesses across the country over the last two decades. When asked as of why Serbia has decided to sue NATO 19 years after the attacks, the lawyer said, considering the horrific consequences for our population, it is never too late to sue someone who's caused an environmental catastrophe, someone who bombed Serbia with a quasi-nuclear weapon, i.e. depleted uranium. Countries who were part of NATO at the time need to pay compensation for those affected by the alleged uranium munitions. Why has Serbia decided to sue NATO after 19 years? The NATO bombing of Serbia in 1999 used between 10 and 15 tons of depleted uranium, which caused a major environmental disaster. I think it is never too late to sue someone for an environmental catastrophe. NATO first used depleted uranium in Iraq in 1991. The alliance has not been put on trial for this act, but the consequences are disastrous. We expect compensation for the financial and non-financial damages inflicted by all members of NATO that participated, directly or indirectly. The 19 countries who were members of NATO at the time should provide compensation to all the citizens who died or fell sick as a proven result of the NATO bombing. This is one of the several lawsuits against NATO over the past few years. In 2009, the victims of a German-led NATO strike in Afghanistan sued for compensation after the attack reportedly killed dozens of civilians. And in 2011, Wilmar Gaddafi's daughter filed a lawsuit over a NATO airstrike that reportedly killed her infant daughter, brother and two nephews. NATO's press office says it is now aware of Serbia's allegations, but gave no further comment. The Serbian lawyer says 19 countries that were part of NATO at the time need to pay compensation for the financial and non-financial damages to all the citizens who died or fell sick as a proven result of the NATO bombing. Now, as I've said for the nearly 12 years of running Media Monarchy, if you've never seen the photos... If you've never image searched depleted uranium, as I've always said, I dare you. You can't unsee them. Huge viewer discretion advised. Hey, as long as we're admitting things on your morning monarchy for Monday, June 19th, 2017. Again, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. A lot of world news to talk about this morning. and You can find it all using hashtag geopolitics. We spell it with a K on Twitter. You know, all commie style. The State Department has released a trove of documents that give insight into the CIA's role in the 1953 coup d'etat that led to the overthrow of Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. The newly declassified documents, innocuously titled Foreign Relations of the United States, 1952 to 1954, Iran, 1951 to 1954. They provide a notable difference from the State Department's 1989 version of the coup, which left out any involvement from American and British intelligence. A memorandum from the Director of Central Intelligence, Alan Dulles, to President Eisenhower dated March 1, 1953, serves as a reminder that the elimination of Mosaddegh by assassination or otherwise was used as a method in repairing ties with Iran, restoring oil negotiations, and stopping a commie takeover. 
Quote, ever since the assassination of General Rasmara in March 1951 and the subsequent impasse and diplomatic break with Britain over the oil negotiations, the Iranian situation has been slowly disintegrating. The result has been a steady decrease in the power and influence of the Western democracies and the building up of a situation where a communist takeover is becoming more and more of a possibility. However, even the present crisis is likely to be unsatisfactorily compromised without a communist toot of victory. And of course, the elimination of Mosaddegh by assassination or otherwise might precipitate defi- decisive events, except in the unlikely alternative that the Shah should regain courage and decisiveness. Another conspiracy theory that turned out to be true, State Department finally admits that the U.S. government helped plan and execute the 1953 Iranian coup. So when you hear all these accusations and crocodile tears about meddling in elections, you know where to point to. You just mentioned 1953. Israel's green-lighted plans for over 8,000 new homes in the West Bank, with over a third for immediate construction, the defense minister revealed on Sunday yesterday, making it the largest expansion of Jewish settlements in the area in 25 years, actually two Sundays ago. According to Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman, 3,651 settlements were approved last week, Haaretz reports. The minister noted that what we've approved on June 6 and 7 is the maximum that can be approved. Plans for 8,345 new housing units have been approved by the Israeli authorities so far this year, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency writes, citing Lieberman. Out of these, 3,066 have been given final approval and will soon be built. So that's the largest West Bank settlement construction in 25 years. As it kind of seems as we look around, we're reaching elements and levels that we haven't seen in 25 years. But as I like to do, always trying to point out the latest false flag attacks. Another classic false flag attack. Police said Sunday that they had arrested, is this two Sundays ago? Yes, two Sundays ago. And we're getting this from timesofisrael.com. Police said Sunday that they had arrested two teenagers on suspicion of dobbing swastikas on two synagogues in the central town of Petah Tikva. A police source confirmed to the Times of Israel that the suspects, both 17 years old, from Petah Tikva and Haifa, are both Jewish. On June 3rd, police received a report that a swastika had been sprayed on the walls of a synagogue in another, on Yusishkin Street in the city. An investigation was opened that led to the arrest of the two minors. An investigation is continuing. In April, police launched an investigation after Nazi images appeared as screensavers on a computer in the same city. Several students were detained by police after a complaint was filed about two memes of Hitler in concentration camps which appeared on the computer. So they're just mentioning some other random attack that had to do with images. This is another classic false flag. Jewish suspects arrested over swastika graffiti on synagogues. I love following these stories, and anytime you see these false flag stories busted, please tweet them at me. It's important to add those to the stack. Just as we've talked about here many, many, many times. Girl of color found running KKK Twitter account in Florida. Classic false flag events. And again, that's how these things work. We're talking about them on grand, massive levels when we talk about big, huge events worldwide. And then just the little local ones from top to bottom. It is always worth investigating the false flag nature. Now that word gets thrown around a hell of a lot anymore. And I think people just sort of mean shorthand. And of course, the the fake news media has been a huge help in kind of muddying the waters as alternative media has forced the term false flag into the public consciousness. It doesn't just mean fake. It means you're trying to blame it on your opposition. Let's continue our geopolitics news, my friends. As we nearly always have some sort of obituaries on your Morning Monarchy episodes. Helmut Kohl, Germany's first post-Cold War chancellor, has died at the age of 87. He served as chancellor from 82 until 98, oversaw the reunification of East and West Germany during his time in office. He is also seen as one of the architects of the Euro. Helmut Kohl did not just have greatness thrust upon him, he seized it. Building a reunified Germany from the rubble of the Berlin Wall, crumbling under the weight of East German people power and Soviet reform in Moscow. 
The right to self-determination is a basic right for all human beings. We demand this right for all in Europe. We demand this right for the German people. Many thought the longest-serving German Chancellor of the 20th century would not last long when he took power in 1982. Some said he talked like a country bumpkin and that he had rough manners. But no matter, he did have vision. Visiting East Germany during the Cold War, working on détente, but also allowing the United States to deploy tactical nuclear weapons in West Germany in response to a similar Soviet move in East Germany. Still, he's not remembered for how he waged the Cold War, but how he helped end it, granting East Germans the same rights and currency as those in the West, and with France at the same time designing economic and monetary union across Europe and the new euro currency. Helmut Kohl called it the other side of the coin to German reunification, a unified Europe. France and Germany must be at its core, Kohl would say, and with French President François Mitterrand, he worked hard to lay to rest their nation's bitter past. Kohl was pushed out of office by his one-time protégé, Angela Merkel, after a party financing scandal. But as he struggled with ill health in his final years, she made peace with the man many call the father of modern Germany. The Germans issued a Helmut Kohl stamp while he was still alive in the new currency he helped create. Good for postage in all of the new Germany. He reunified. Well, bounced by Merkel. See, past his prologue, my friends. Even when we dive back into the 80s and 90s, we're learning the parts that are influencing and affecting us right now. And I think, as I've been saying, we are sitting in times right now that are going to be discussed for a long time. Future conspiracy dis discussions are now being crafted and played out in front of our very eyes. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Monday, June 19th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so very much more. We've been online since 9-11-05. We don't really believe in parties, and we don't really do the left-right divide. And hopefully the consistency of our work is what hopes, you know, helps it rise above. And it just keeps coming. The U.S. Navy says one of its destroyers, USS Fitzgerald, collided with a Philippine-flagged merchant vessel off the coast of Japan. Authorities are still determining whether there are injuries and the extent of structural damage. They know that there are injuries. They know that there are bodies. The Navy says the Japanese Coast Guard has been assisting the destroyer, which experienced flooding in some places and was on its way back to port in Yokosuka. All our thoughts and prayers are with the Fitzgerald crew and their families. The guided missile destroyer recently, of course, took part in training exercises with the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, along with the aircraft carriers USS Carl Vinson and, of course, the USS Ronald Reagan. Well, we're going to start here this morning with true breaking news. Overnight, the search for the seven missing sailors aboard the USS Fitzgerald has now sadly been called off. The bodies were found in the flooded compartments of the U.S. Navy destroyer which collided with a container ship off the coast of Japan. And this development comes as we are learning more about the final moments before the crash, the bizarre course change right before impact and the investigation the Navy plans on launching. ABC's Matt Gutman is on the story from our Los Angeles bureau this morning. Good morning, Matt. Hey, good morning, Paul and Dan. Now, we knew the collision with that behemoth cargo ship was devastating. We're now learning that the U.S. naval ship nearly sank, taking on a huge amount of water. The container ship plowing right into the sleeping quarters of 160 sailors in the middle of the night. The Navy now calling the crash and the fight to save the ship traumatic. This morning, the Navy revealing that hellish collision nearly sank the USS Fitzgerald. The damage you see to the ship's mangled midsection, relatively minimal in comparison to what happened beneath the waterline. So the water flow uh, was tremendous. And so there wasn't a lot of time in those spaces uh, that were open to the sea. And uh, as you can see now, the ship is still listing. The collision with the 30,000-ton ACX Crystal Friday night in one of the world's busiest shipping lanes got the 500-foot-long destroyer's middle compartments, the container ship's bulbous bow plowing right into the living quarters. Three compartments uh, were severely damaged, uh, one machinery room and two birthing areas. 
that uh, berthing areas for 116 of the crew, and also the uh, uh, ship or the uh, ship's skipper's uh, uh, cabin as well. The skipper, the ship's commander, survived but had to be medevaced along with two others. The Navy says there were other injuries which were treated on board. And this morning, the Navy is calling off the search and rescue. Divers went through the sealed off sections of the ship, locating the remains of all seven missing sailors. That as a now unexplained twist arises. Multiple maritime trackers show the ACX Crystal cargo ship completing a giant U-turn just minutes before colliding with the U.S. naval vessel. The parent company of ACX has not yet responded to ABC News requests for comment. But the Navy is vowing multiple investigations. Under my authority, we will uh, launch a Jagman investigation into this collision. I will appoint a flag officer uh, to lead that investigation, and there will also be a safety investigation. Now, the multiple Navy and civilian investigations will likely examine why that container ship hooked that seemingly abrupt U-turn, and more importantly for the Navy, why the Fitzgerald with its sophisticated radar didn't see it. The Navy said it will appoint an admiral-level officer to lead that investigation. Dan and Paula. It's a really sad and confusing story. Matt, thank you. So that's news from Disney. And again, everything we say in play will all be included in the show notes, all the links, all the articles. And again, we need all the updates from you as well. Seven dead. And even as I glance at the breaking news right now, it just keeps on coming. Arson attacks disrupt German railways ahead of G20 summit. Police suspect far-left activists trying to disrupt upcoming summit. Shut down G20. And as we've been saying for several, several months, radical left terror is having quite the renaissance. And I don't really know, and this is, of course, this is, you know, it's just classic strategy attention. Pressure from above, pressure from below. I'm not sure how much longer London can hang on. Jane, thank you very much for talking to us live on Sky News. You're, you're clearly very, very moved by the events. You, you were here, or you could see what happened at the Tower during the night when it was on fire. I watched it from the very beginning when it first started, and it was very small. But very, very quickly, it went up the sides of the building. But we could see on the left-hand side, the building was untouched. But the right-hand side, it was in flames, and the huge flames, like meters coming up the building. Within 20 minutes, it was really, really bad. It's the sense of helplessness, isn't it? When I was here on the night, there were people, there were hundreds of people on the street, just simply watching, knowing that there were families trapped inside and, and none of us could do anything to help them. But after, after, after this is no longer a news item and all your TV crews aren't here, who's going to help us? The government promises things. The report is going to take years before they do all their um, witness statements and they produce a report and they do all their findings. There will not be any immediate answers. But this community, they need people to do things now. Like, for example, there's no organisation here to find the missing people. My daughter spent the last three days working in one of the reception centres, helping, and she said, there are bags and tents full of body bags, but no one's accounting for them. In the missing, the people who are dead, they aren't listed because they've not been identified. So the massive cover-up of the Grenfell Tower is well underway. And it's going to be a long, hot summer. We will see the first day of summer here in just a couple of days, my friends. The 21st on Wednesday. That'll be a Food World Order Day. And that'll be the official beginning of a long, hot summer. A mid-cutter crisis, Gaza hit by power cuts. Feel in the shadow of war, the Gulf crisis isolates further Hamas and leaves Gazans without hope for an early solution to their deepening problems. When I tried to do a little more research on this and perhaps find a news clip, just went back years and years. Oh, which story do you want about power outages in Qatar? The one from four years ago? We need some updates as well from Venezuela. The public safety infrastructure in Venezuela has been degraded to such a degree that citizens now take justice into their own hands. AFP reported that lynchings have risen sharply over the last year and a half as political and economic instability in the crumbling socialist republic has worsened. Witnesses who spoke to the agency French Press said a 22-year-old man was set on fire in an anti-government demonstration in May was actually lynched after being accused of stealing by the crowd. 
not because he was a government sympathizer, as President Nicolas Maduro had suggested at the time. As AFP alleges, it is not just the country's economic and political systems that are sick, but society itself. An epidemic of lynchings is one of the most gruesome symptoms. Dateline Miami. Pressing pause on a historic detente, President Donald Trump thrust the U.S. and Cuba back on a path toward open hostility Friday with a blistering denunciation of the island's communist government. He clamped down on some commerce and travel but left intact many new avenues President Barack Obama had opened. The Cuban government responded Friday evening by rejecting what it called Trump's hostile rhetoric. Still, Cuba said it is willing to continue respectful dialogue with topics on mutual interest. And finally, the last story on our stack in some way to segue in tomorrow's Tech Tuesday coverage. Alphabet Incorporated's Google said it's creating new policies and practices to suppress terrorism-related videos, a response to UK lawmakers who have said the internet is a petri dish for radical ideology. We've been following that for you on New World Next Week, as well as your cyberspace war news. Google says it'll do more to suppress terrorist propaganda, so by that point... As our buddy Apollo Slater says, it's just going to have to delist all U.S. government websites. All those stories we put together for you on a Twitter moment. We published those about an hour before showtime. So if you are listening live, you can follow along and see what we're going to talk about. Any other time, if you just check hashtag geopolitics, you'll see all of those stories and many, many, many more stories. We're not just crowdfunded. We are crowdsourced. The news is brought to you by you. You're creating the news feeds that we need. You can get all the hashtags for the daily episodes up on the top of the tweets. And again, we're going to go out today with brand new music from Arcade Fire. Second song from their upcoming fifth album, Everything Now, which is coming out on July 28th, is out. It's called Creature Comfort. And it is official. Arcade Fire did leave their mighty independent home of Merge Records out of North Carolina after four albums, after topping the charts, after winning the Grammy for album of the year. I guess that's maybe not good enough, and they had to sign to Columbia. I knew it probably wasn't going to go well when I saw Arcade Fire show up on stage with all the title gangsters and Madonna and Kanye and Jay-Z and all them. But we're going to listen to that brand new Arcade Fire again, art greater than artist. But first, let's take the always important stroll down this day in history. June 19th, 1846, the first officially recorded organized baseball game is played under Alexander Cartwright's rules on Hoboken, New Jersey's Elysian Fields with the New York Baseball Club defeating the Knickerbockers 23-1. to That's quite the trouncing. I guess they didn't have the slaughter rule yet. June 19, 1862, the U.S. Congress prohibits slavery in the United States territories, nullifying Dred Scott v. Sanford. Three years later, over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, slaves in Galveston, Texas, are finally informed of their freedom. The anniversary is still officially celebrated in Texas and 41 other contiguous states as Juneteenth. That's why you're seeing that word trend. Juneteenth. June 19th, 1910. The first Father's Day was celebrated, guess where? In Spokane, Washington. 1934, the Communications Act of 1934 establishes the United States Federal Communications Commission, a.k.a. the FCC. June 19th, 1949, the first ever NASCAR race was held at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And on this day, 1953, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were convicted of conspiring to pass U.S. atomic secrets to the Soviets, are executed at Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York. Both refused to admit any wrongdoing and proclaimed their innocence right up to the time of their deaths by electric chair. The Rosenbergs were the first U.S. citizens to be convicted and executed for espionage during peacetime, and their case remains controversial to this day. One of the greatest peacetime spy dramas in the nation's history reaches its climax as Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel, convicted of revealing atomic secrets to the Russians, enter the federal building in New York to hear their doom. Another of the spy ring, Mrs. Ethel Rosenberg, who with her husband was convicted of actually transmitting the secrets to Russia through Soviet diplomatic channels. The ring was first uncovered following the arrest of Klaus Fuchs in England. David Greenglass, Mrs. Rosenberg's brother, confessed theft of the secrets while stationed at the Los Alamos Atomic Project. 
He later became the government's chief witness in the prosecution of Sobel and the Rosenbergs. It is a stern jurist they face in Judge Irving Kaufman. After administering a tongue lashing in which he charged them with the indirect death of thousands of men in Korea, he sentenced both Rosenbergs to death in the electric chair and Sobel to 30 years in prison. At the time these pictures were made, Greenglass still had to hear his fate. It is the first time in peacetime that such a death penalty has been handed down. And while appeals to the highest courts are planned, it certainly appears that the spies are headed along a one-way street. So that's the super dramatic newsreel, of course, at their trial. Now, on this day in history, they were executed. And our buddy Courage Sauer notes that, of course, Carol Quigley names the people that really sent the info to Russia in the book Tragedy and Hope. Continuing to look at this day in history, June 19th, 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is approved after surviving an 83-day filibuster in the United States Senate. June 19th, 1980, Donna Summer becomes the first act to sign with the brand new Geffen Records. June 19th, 1982, in one of the first militant attacks by Hezbollah, David S. Dodge, president of the American University of Beirut, is kidnapped. 1985, members of the Revolutionary Party of Central American Workers, dressed as Salvadoran soldiers, attack the Zona Rosa area of San Salvador, another classic false flag attack. June 19, 1998, over 3,000 East Germans gathered at the Berlin Wall to hear Michael Jackson performing a concert on the other side of the wall in West Berlin. June 19, 1991, the Soviet occupation of Hungary ends on this day. 2009, mass riots involving over 10,000 people and 10,000 cops break out in Shishu, China over the dubious circumstances surrounding the death of a local chef. And on June 19, 2012, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange requested asylum in London's Ecuadorian embassy for fear of extradition to the U.S. after publication of previously classified documents, including footage of civilian killings by the U.S. Army. Now published to Media Monarchy 10 years ago today, Jersey Girls demand release of CIA 9-11 report. That came actually from Raw Story, if you can believe it. A group, of comp, of, of, a group composed of widows of 9-11 victims demanding the release of a key CIA report. Also published to Media Monarchy 10 years ago today, Ed and Elaine Brown's press conference. Remember that? Calling the federal agents surrounding his fortified compound guns for hire. A New Hampshire man convicted of tax evasion vowed that he and his wife would fight U.S. Marshals. June 19th. 2007 posted Media Monarchy, 9-11 could be an inside job, so says Academy Award winner Michael Moore when answering questions on 9-11 Truth during a sneak peek of his, at the time, documentary Sicko in New York. Finally published to my own website a decade ago today, punk singer-songwriter Henry Rollins took on the Iraq War profiteers on his IFC channel. Tease off on Halliburton-style privatization. Celebrating birthdays today, June 19th, the amazing Canadian-American violinist and band leader Guy Lombardo, born on this day, 1902. I know as a little kid when I would kind of dig through my grandma's cassette tapes and 8-track tapes. It's like, Guy Lombardo, Guy Lombardo, Mario Lanza, Mario Lanza, Guy Lombardo, and that's pretty much all they are. Fortunately, I was able to get a lot of those. Also born on this day, Lou Gehrig. Lester Flatt, who you might know as half of Flatt and Scruggs. Famed American film critic Pauline Kael, born on this day. Louis Jordan. Tommy DeVito, singer, guitarist for The Four Seasons. It's also Tobias Wolf. You might remember he wrote This Boy's Life. Salman Rushdie's birthday. Nick Drake's birthday. <sighs> Claire Huxtable. Felicia Rasad, born, born on this day. It's also Hearts and Wilson. Simon Wright, he drummed for ACDC for a little while. And it's also the late, not great Lou Pearlman's birthday, American music producer and fraudster, who conveniently for him died in 2016. On my book stack, I've got the hit charade about Lou Pearlman and his musical mastery and money grubbing ways. Basically, built up all the boy bands to be giant, giant sacks of cash and then pulled the parachute for himself. It's Kathleen Turner's birthday. Mark DeBarge, of course, from DeBarge. Paul Abdul, Laura Ingram, Brian Head Welch from Corn, Scott Avitt of the Avitt Brothers, Zoe Saldana from all those superhero movies, and Macklemore. Damn, he's young. 
all those folks born on this day, you know, some of them are going to have to weasel their way into our daily DJ set at noon because with all that's been going on in the media monarchy kingdom, with the server woes and all those things, which again are completely fixed, all your feeds, all your missing episodes should all be there. All the all the morning monarchy shows and especially all the pump up the volume episodes, all on the feeds, mediamonarchy.com slash feed. And we've got your daily DJ set at noon coming up in a little bit. It won't be a full New Music Monday, but we'll still have some new music for you. And we are streaming live essentially Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. If this is it for you, if this is where you get off the bus, we'll talk to you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time for the Tech Tuesday edition of your Morning Monarchy. Hashtag Cyberspace War. But that's your geopolitics news, my friends. Stay safe. Stay strong. Keep your chin up. Don't fall for the fear. That's your Monday Morning Monarchy for June 19th, 2017, as we go out with brand new music from Arcade Fire. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more. Thanking you so much for listening and reminding you, as always, my friends, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.